Hey Cool Worlders, it's David. Today I want to ask you, when would you guess that the first scientific claim of an extrasolar planet was made? Perhaps you'd guess the early 90s, or maybe the late 80s. If you're really ambitious, maybe you'd go all the way back to the 1950s. But it might astonish you to learn that all those answers are wrong. The first claim was all the way back in 1855. Just to give you some reference, that's the Victorian age. I mean, this is when Queen Victoria was still in the first third of her reign over the British Empire. It was the year prior to the Panthe Rebellion in China against the Qing Dynasty. It's a time when Franklin Pierce, the 14th president of the United States, was championing the fugitive slave laws prior to the American Civil War. To me, it is mind-boggling that at this time, there was an astronomer who was trying to detect exoplanets. Now just to be clear, I'm not talking about some crackpot theory that Billy Bob thinks there's an exoplanet around that star. I'm talking about a scientific claim made in a peer-reviewed journal. The paper shown here appeared in the 15th ever volume of the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. That's the oldest major astronomy journal still in active use. And it was authored by Captain, yes, I said Captain, William Stephen Jacob, who was the director of the Madras Observatory in Chennai, India. Captain Jacob was observing the motion of binary star systems, and in this paper, he looked at the motion of 70 of Fuji. In his paper, Jacob argued that when one compares the historical record of the positions of these two stars versus that which one would expect if they're orbiting each other, there is considerable disagreement. Moreover, he argues that this disagreement is not random, as one would expect for just random measurement uncertainties. Instead, there is a systematic shift which slowly changes over the years in a periodic manner. Jacob was trying to detect his planet using what we would now refer to as the astrometry method, and he was probably inspired by the great success of Friedrich Bessel in predicting the presence of white dwarf companions around Sirius and Procyon. But whereas Bessel had been looking at astrometric deviations of order of a few arc seconds, Jacob was looking at something much, much smaller, just 80 milliarc seconds. That's 25 times smaller. Moreover, Jacob had to contend with the influence of the motion caused by the other known object in the system, the other star. Now, curiously, Jacob didn't actually estimate what the mass of his claimed planet was. But using the orbital period of 26 years, the reflex motion amplitude of 0 0.08 arc seconds, the system's distance measurement of 5 parsecs, and Kepler's third law, I would estimate that the 26-year period planet would be 40 Jupiter masses and orbit its star at about 8 astronomical units. Now given that the binary separation is 23 astronomical units, that means that this planet would pass kind of uncomfortably close to the other star in the system, potentially questioning whether it's really stable. Indeed, a revised version of this planetary claim made by Thomas C. in 1899 was later refuted by Forrest Moulton on the grounds of being dynamically unstable. Okay, so this discovery claim didn't work out for our friend Captain William Jacob, but I think there are many remarkable things about this claim in historical hindsight. First off, the data was collected by eye, by a human being looking through a telescope. That's not obviously how we do astronomy these days. We use computer algorithms to objectively measure the positions of stars. Second, now get this, Jacob wasn't even sure if Newton's laws of gravity held in other parts of the universe, and he even calls that out as an alternative hypothesis for this data. Now, if a modern astronomer put that in their paper as the only alternative hypothesis to an exoplanet claim, I mean, it would be kind of ridiculous by modern standards. Third, this exoplanet claim really seems to be the first of its kind. I mean, it precedes the first unambiguous discovery by well over a century. Indeed, this claim comes so early that it even precedes the birth of Carl Pearson, whose famous chi-squared test is one of the bedrocks of statistical tests one might use nowadays to check for the validity of a detection. In other words, Jacob's claim comes so early that modern statistics hadn't been invented yet. And Jacob was forced to look at things like the maximum and average residual after including his planet. I think we have to give Jacob an enormous amount of credit for being so open-minded and bringing exoplanets into the forefront of astronomy. This was a claim made to the best of his abilities using the data that he had in hand at the time. He also treats the detection cautiously, noting at the end of his paper that there is some positive evidence for a planetary body in this system 
which, let's face it, is a lot more of a cautious tone than modern astronomers usually adopt. Sadly, we know relatively little about the man himself. We actually don't even know what he looks like. This portrait of his older brother, John, is probably the closest that we can guess. He was born in 1813 in England and eventually joined the Indian Army, where he rose through the ranks of the Bombay engineers. He set up his own private observatory in Pune, India, a few years before moving to Chennai as the director of the Madras Observatory, which is pictured here. He was a prolific scientific author for his time. He actually authored 51 articles over the span of 19 years. Another sign of his time was that with the exception of a single paper, all of his articles were solo authored. He didn't collaborate with anybody. By today's standards, to do that for every paper would be pretty strange let alone for the fact you're signing your paper's captain. What I find really fascinating about this story is to think about what kinds of seemingly outlandish claims are being made today that perhaps in a hundred years we'll look back at in the same way with this case. Captain William S. Jacob ended up being wrong, but what I find so inspiring about this story is that he had the audacity to try. He applied the scientific method to try to make what would have been an incredible scientific discovery. So I hope you enjoyed this little walk through the history books with me. If you haven't already, then do make sure you click the subscribe button below so you can get all of the videos from the Cool Words channel. Thank you so much for watching everybody, and until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious. How do you say king? I'm gonna Google pronunciation of king. Ching. C-H-I-N-G, ching. Thank <laughs> you.